Yeah. Hello everyone. Thank you very much for choosing this presentation. I am surprised actually to see you because nobody knows what ASML does. Huh? It's unbelievable. So I work for ASML. I live like uh, 30 kilometers away from it. And uh, all the neighbors like, where do you work ASML? And what is ASML? So I will explain what the hell is ASML, right? And, and, and how we organize the, um, well, continuous integration pipeline. Right? Not too much technical details, just the basic concepts. And uh, I think we have enough of time. So if you have questions, criticism, comments, whatever, at the end, just shoot. And if I will lose you some way along the way, also just like interrupt and say, yeah, you lost me, please explain this and that. All right? Okay, let's start. So CI-CD pipeline, which enables Moore's law and propels world to the future. And this is absolutely true. And uh, what the hell I'm talking about? We'll talk about, there will be two blocks. Like, first of all, what is semiconductor industry? And uh, what ASML does there? And then software integration and testing at ASML. And it will be like good architecture, high cohesion, low coupling. No. Uh, semiconductor industry is actually all about enabling Moore's law. What the heck is Moore's law? It's basically pure self-fulfilled prophecy. Somewhere in 1960s, a uh, very bright uh, engineer, Gordon Moore, said, you know what? I have a couple of data points I can extrapolate uh, way into the future, and I predict that uh, rate of increase of transistors in a chip will be doubling every two years. And of course, this one reminds me very much on this comic, right? When you try to do extrapolation only on a couple of uh, points. But uh, this is exactly what is going on. Huh? So last, uh, well, uh, more than 50 years, uh, the whole world doing that, right? So we get new processes, new RAM, new NAND flash, SSDs, the whatever, and everything is become Faster and faster and cheaper and cheaper. Uh, basic concept, how, how it is achieved. Basically, uh, chips are able, we're able to make chips smaller, 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 smaller and smaller. And then what is the well, advantage to make something smaller? Uh, analogy with books. If you have a book which is printed on a 14 points uh, font and it 227 pages, so you make a font smaller, the boom, uh, everything is fit on a way uh, less amount of uh, pages. Like main principle of the Moore's law, right? Um, and it's basically economics law, huh? just economics. So everybody create uh, roadmaps according to it, and everybody try to keep up with the roadmaps. And consumers also kind of expect that, right? You all want to have like new smartphone and uh, next year and it should be faster and uh, smaller. Yeah, maybe screen is big, I don't know. But uh, RAM inside should be growing and uh, more cores, whatever. No. It also kind of uh, very much influenced on the price. Huh? So somewhere not that long ago for me, so 2005, pff, it's literally for one gigabyte you pay 100 and now it's like uh, zero one, right? Uh, other comparison, maybe nice analogy, uh, ASML was established 1984, so there were other players at that market uh, at that time, but actually nice to compare 1984 to now, so you can compare like a personal computer at that time with just a smartphone of now, and um, you see how the progress is just uh, tremendous. And actually at that time, uh, it was also a lot of things were not... Uh, Imagine that they will happen. So such a rate of innovation also creates uh, new things. Like, like we have cloud now. We used to call it servers. Now we call cloud. So this is new. And, uh, well, gaming, of course, speeding up uh, dramatically. Uh, intelligent age, I think it's something new, actually. Huh? Because we always have concept before. So you have your mainframe. Right? And then you have your personal computer, and now it's again, uh, well, you will do everything in the cloud, but uh, maybe now not everything. So maybe also some processing you will do around your local device. And artificial intelligence is booming, and uh, well, 
mobile infrastructure is also growing very fast and it's also kind of the beginning huh? because in the very near future everything will be connected to everything internet of everything is really 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 coming internet of things and uh, in order to enable it Again, you need uh, semiconductor equipment, semiconductor industry, because, uh, well, when you talk about progress of semiconductors, it's not only um, processors and RAM and NAND, but it also this tiny, like, uh, sensors and the Bluetooth devices and Wi-Fi and uh, power supplies. And as Sheldon Cooper said, uh, everything is better with Bluetooth, right? So we need way more Bluetooth devices everywhere. And then, of course, you already have a bunch of electronic devices on you, right? A lot of it. And, uh, well, fun fact, at least 85% of chips of those devices made on ASML machines, at least. So, now a little bit like zoom in to economic part and then how big is the ASML on a uh, world scale, world economics. So there is a very cool site, uh, finviz.com. It can visualize complete stock market of United States. Just on one slide, right? And then each company, the size of the company is proportional to yeah, how much money it costs. And uh, can you spot ASML here? Well, actually, you can, right? So it's inside the block, which is called semiconductor equipment. And ASML is like you, half of it. But uh, is that the influence? Well, not really, because ASML creates machines which actually goes to those guys. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, those guys like uh, Intel and uh, NVIDIA and TSMC. So they can create their modern chips, right? So if ASML will not produce new machine, will be no new advancement on technology on... Uh, CPUs, for example, right? You will not get this uh, beta nanometers and stuff. But, uh, well, when you create all those chips, of course, all the kind of uh, software guys start to benefit from them. And so it does not stop there. And, of course, Google benefits from them and uh, Amazon and Tesla and uh, all this financial stuff where robots basically trading nowadays. So probably it's uh, better to show where ISM, where ISML is not influencing but uh, I did not do that. So in modern world, semiconductors are freaking everywhere. No? Yeah, pretty sure. Uh, let me show you how the chip look like from inside, right? I have a nice animation. I borrowed it or stole it from my colleague. It's supposed to work. Yeah. So check it out. So this is cheap, and then it's actually on a wafer. So on a wafer, you create a bunch of them. And then when you zoom in, there are multiple layers. And I will touch a little bit how layers are made just to give you introduction huh? so you understand the stuff because ISML machines are very cool. There are a bunch of robots inside and uh, yeah, so layers. We go further. Yes, so lithography, it's about printing, printing. We print. What the hell we print? Yes. So it all starts with silicon wafer. ISML does not make wafers. Somebody else makes the wafers. I don't know who, but somebody does. Right? When you have your wafer and it's like perfectly pure and flat, at least it looks flat, but on nanometer scale, trust me, it's like mountains and valleys and everything. You apply photoresist. Yeah, and this is just from our fab. Uh, in industrial fab, of course, robots transform all those wafers and everything is automated. So you apply photoresist. And then with photoresist, the uh, wafer comes inside the machine. Robot picks it up, put it inside, wafer still being measured. And after that, being exposed. What does it mean being exposed? It means light will go through mask or reticle where one layer of a chip is kind of a drone, right? So we will put this image on a wafer, right? And because you do it uh, with light and you already have photoresist, so you will change uh, chemical uh, properties of photoresist. And uh, after that, uh, you can remove some parts apply new layer of photoresist and repeat the process. So it looks like uh, this, uh, so machine, wafer goes into machine, first it being measured, then it being exposed, so this light is going through reticle, um, changes chemical properties, after that you remove the wafer, remove what should be removed, and then basically apply again photoresist and repeat the process. So machines in real production fab, they always work in a chain. 
right? Each machine making one layer and wafer just traveling through them. And it's yeah, super important that such machine well, will never stop because of some reliability issue, God forbid, from software. Because if it stops, you will actually disturb a huge chain. And then a lot of wafers will be unusable. So you saw on one wafer, like a lot of chips. And then if it's like one of the last layers and you disturbed it, this wafer is goes to scrap. So it's totally not cool that there are very, very high requirements for reliability of software. This is funny. Nowadays, we can actually make a lot of layers on top of each other. And it's why, why I say it's funny, because we are saying, yeah, Gordon Moore, uh, Cini, every two years, double amount of chips. Around 2015, some of producers of flash memory were kind of worried. They were saying, you know what? The cells becoming are so small, we can literally almost count electrons inside. And those electrons, they can diffuse in and outside. And what the hell is the chart? Not chart. We don't know. So this was kind of a way out. So I believe Samsung was the pioneer in there. They developed a the technology where you can create many, many layers on top. But each layer cells are still kind of big. So decent amount of electrons inside. So it's also kind of artificial way to get, get Moore's law going. It should never stop. Right. No, ISML role, I will not show this video. Yeah, no, you can watch it. This is important. This is important. One of the things which also ISML does, we produce machines which serve for tens of years. So fun fact, think about it even. We have now a bunch of developers at ISML which were born later than we created our, I don't know, twin scans in the beginning of 2000s. And software which those guys and girls are writing actually still need to support all those machines from the uh, beginning of 20 to, of, of 2000s. Because it also kind of uh, our promise to customers, huh? when you get our scanner, you also will be able to upgrade it. We will kind of never leave you behind, right? So it also, now you can imagine implication for software, amount of configurations, which we still need to support, and then amount of regression testing. Right? It's kind of uh, huge. Yes. Yeah? Yeah? Okay. So machines, uh, new ones coming all the time. Couple of facts just to, I don't know, blow your mind uh, how difficult and so how huge they are. Yeah. I borrowed this slide from a colleague. <laughs> but you can read us. Uh, so amazing stuff. You need three big airplanes to transport one machine. Great. I edit one more slide. Also maybe to amaze you a little bit, I don't know. What is in common between like 4,000 minis and maybe two basic configuration F-35 Raptors and one uh, EUV machine from ASML and four Lionel Messi's or, or, or Lionel Messi for four years? What is in common? Exactly 160 millions approximately. So yeah, I think it's pretty cool. No? But price is one thing. Yeah? The bigger, 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 more interesting thing is like try to imagine nanometers, right? Your hair grows like 4.75 nanometers per second. Literally, every second. And uh, this huge machine, this huge chucks where wafer positions 300 millimeters, we able to position it with such accuracy. And it's constantly with movement. And it's not slow movement because you need to produce like what? 4,000 wafers a day at least on many machines. And you can imagine now uh, it's moving fast. You have stresses and everything. And on nanometer scale, you actually can compensate it. So I dare to say mechatronic and optics technology of ASML machines, the best in solar system. I don't dare to say observable universe, but solar system for sure. No discussions, right? Oh, an important software, important. Without software, machine is dead. Yeah? So software is the soul of the twin scan. <laughs> oh, other cool thing, last, last thing, yeah, then we go to software. So in order to produce UV light is literally like, uh, uh, well, I don't know, Star Wars technology. So we have like uber powerful laser which shoots into um, liquid tin, right? 
and it uh, not evaporates it, it put it in the plasma state. So power of this laser is basically close to military one. And of course controlled by software, right? So excellent, excellent stuff to play with. Yeah. <laughs> right. Now let's talk about software. So you saw that there are a lot of moving parts of the machine to get wafer in, measure it, uh, expose it at the same time the other one, move the places, right? because after measure you need to go to expose, after expose you need to go back and to unload it to next process, and you need to control that powerful laser. So basically, basically, we don't have like one computer inside. We have like maybe 20, and they're all running uh, on different operating systems, no. Some, so we definitely use Linux, no discussion. So now our main computers where, for example, you will find graphical user interface and data processing and modeling. But we also have dedicated computers for robots. Robots which uh, handle wafers, which handle reticles. They are running also on Linux, but more embedded variant. And some hardware runs on VxWorks. And some runs even on bare metal, where you really, really have control loops of like, I don't know, 20, 20 kilohertz or so. So different computers, they all talk to each other um, because we have uh, facilities kind of abstracted from a developer. So developer don't really care uh, whether he or she writes software for a robot or for um, component which actually calculates some corrections because everything is kind of this diversity and complexity is hidden by a framework. But we do have a lot of code in different languages. So historically, it started that we started with C, right? Then now more and more C++ is coming. We also have Java, no doubt about that. Uh, Python, MATLAB, a lot. Size of our code archive, so here it says 50 million lines of code, and it says production and test code. And test is not like to test code to test our software. No, no, no. It's a test code which actually checks that machine is all right, that keeps machine in shape. If you will try to count also all the re literally test code and test vectors and reference files, you can actually multiply it by 10 at least. So archive is huge. It's all based still on a rational clear case. I don't know if you know about this system. Rational clear case, rational clear quest. So highly customized actually to support this huge software archive. Yeah, it consists of like 500 uh, VOPs. Developers a lot, a lot, yeah, thousand started. Uh, when I started 16 years ago, I think we have like a couple of hundred, yeah. Now it's a couple of thousand uh, commits. Yeah, not that much actually, but uh, we will come later to the thing. So imagine uh, those machines and we need to integrate software which developers make. So how it was all working uh, two years ago. Two years ago, we have this uh, nice cycle. I think it's nice, which like was totally logical, at least from manager point of view. Like we start somewhere at nine o'clock when integration window is open, this green stuff, right? And it looks like from nine till four, it's open. And then it's uh, this yellow part because maybe your last integration you took it at four o'clock. So you need some time to integrate it. When everything is integrated, you start it build. Excellent, build is finished. And then, uh, well, you do export, and export basically packaging. You prepare your software to install, right? Because after integration, this new fresh baseline, we got a test, and to test, well, we install it on a system, not on real scanner, but we install on virtual ones, and on such called test rigs. So where all uh, electronics is present, but robots are simulated. Image creation is basically the software installation. You create your virtual systems or you install it on test rig. And after that, it was like whole night of testing because we have so many test regression impact, right? You still remember. And after that, from seven to nine, we have a special team to analyze the results. So all those tests at night, are they okay or not okay? Mm, something failed, should we rerun? Ooh, something stably failing? Ooh, which delivery did it? So it was all kind of uh, manual, but it worked, right? And if it works, don't touch it. You, you all know the rule. 
But, but, <laughs> again, approximately what? Year ago, new requirements came in. So this new machines are coming, which are still in development, and then there, we would like to make a new uh, operating system upgrade, going to next revision of the Linux. And difference is so big to previous one, well, it's a new compiler. So actually, you need to build twice. And if you build twice, well, you know what? Before you gain confidence that everything is good on binary level, yeah, you know what? You better test twice, right? And if you try to like double build and double this image creation and double test, like, there's no time, no time anymore. So we talk to physics guys, we say, hey, is it possible to get more than 24 hours in one day? They were laughing. So apparently not, at least not yet. So we say, you know what, okay, we're going to dive in data. Maybe it's not so bad. Maybe if you look in details, it's way better, right? Well, it was not, it was worse. <laughs> so if you look what was the reality, apparently to start integration at nine was kind of mission impossible. Always this analysis was taking place. So integration window was tiny. So we kind of integration team start to understand, yeah, all this kind of source of frustration and complaints. Yeah, we were not able to integrate and blah, blah, blah. So we started to two actions in parallel. First of all, you need to optimize everything you can in this uh, integration open window, right? So not a second is lost. And then you need to see how to reduce those uh, big other bulks. You have to do it, there is no way around it. So our lesson one was you assume nothing. So all the presentations which they show you how it works, you throw it away and we what logs show. Because logs do not lie. So always, always look at raw data. Now, how it worked in the past. Developer is ready and uh, he or she also tested and then said, okay, we are ready to integrate in main trunk. So basically, they were approaching one of the integrators, so real human being who will like be like very serious and say, yeah, did you test good? Yeah, I test good. Are you document under change control? Yeah, under change control. Everybody signed off. Everybody signed off. Okay, we will integrate. Human-based. Integrate. And because humans are integrating, sometimes uh, two developers, yeah, rarely, but sometimes it happens, they touch the same file, right? And then integrator is actually able to figure out yeah, how to resolve this overlap. So sometimes same files were attached by multiple deliveries and then we integrate. But of course, the fun started when you test at night. Huh? And then some tests are starting to fail and they are failing exactly because of some file is touched, which was modified by different projects. It was not nice. So one of the improvements which was immediately made, we say, you know what? We go in this pipeline till the integration in the uh, main line. Yeah, we go in automate. And I will show you how it was done. Oh yeah, first, first I will tell you how we usually try to solve the problem when you're out of capacity. How you solve it? Well, you add more people, right? Because people do the job, you add more people. But, of course, you need to open the book from like what, 1950 or 1960, Mystical Man Months. Everybody knows the book? Yeah, no. Oh, it's a beautiful graph, huh? So it's a dependency of lead time and the amount of people who are working. So when you have one people, one person, one engineer, yeah, it takes a lot of time. You add second one, yeah, maybe it will be faster, maybe. Huh? You can add more, you will reach some sweet point where it's minimum. After that, adding more, well, does not work. Just does not work. The classical example, I don't know whether it's used here a lot, like, well, Nine women cannot give birth for a one baby in one month. We can try it, it does not work. So don't try to add more people. It was kind of our hard learned lesson. And the guy who wrote the book, he's aged now, and he also said something nice. I like it very much because I fully agree what he's saying. And you cannot deny the mathematics. Try to deny it, it totally adds up. So, so, we started basically from the scratch. We say, you know what? This is ridiculous even to have a target that at nine o'clock integration is open. Nine o'clock, uh, which time zone? ISML become international. Developers in the United States do not really happy that actually when they wake up, integration is closed. <laughs> so, no, that's it. We always do it that way, throw it away. Nine o'clock, not good. We need to do ASAP. 
So we need to close integration only to build, to test, to analyze, and immediately open. Doesn't matter what time it is. So we replaced everything with automation, but I think yeah, I like to imagine our automation a little bit differently. And I will explain. You need to imagine very friendly, infinite patience, but super paranoid robot. And I think uh, this guy looked like that, right? So when you think you are ready, you just tap him on the shoulder like, I'm ready. He's like, yeah, you think you're ready? Okay, don't worry. And then how it works? This guy basically will check everything. There are no questions. Did you test, test this or test that? Regression test set is kind of defined. It also tuned based on what is changed inside the delivery. Yeah? So we have automation for that. And then we are not asking, did somebody review document or not? We just run all the checks and all the tests. This is the only way to go. Because this is the only way to gain confidence that everything is okay. None of this old, no, old not good. None of the mature vintage scanners will be impacted. So vintage mature scanners also will work even with the latest software, right? There is another added value of that. Because we create baseline every day for many years already, basically none of the deliveries or very small part, actually able to provide you delivery, which is rebased to the latest baseline. In many cases, you get a delivery which was completed maybe one week ago, and then a couple of days they were testing, and then they yeah, wrote some nice documents that, okay, we are done because it was our software free, so they based on something older. So you need to rebase, and we put it in our pipeline, right? So we put this away from developer, we rebase, and we test. And if test failing, yeah, you cannot argue with Arnold, right? You just, yeah. You get your delivery back, and then with exact explanation what should be fixed, yeah, what is failing, you fix it and uh, here we go, up, uh, press a button again or call RESTful API handover, Pfft, no problem. It will be picked up and uh, if tests are passing, you will be integrated in a main trunk. So this is the way how we do it, uh, integration scene. And uh, yeah, we have it, a cool name, OB, one button integration. Maybe now it should be called like one API call integration, I don't know. Yeah, a little bit on, uh, because I was touching on merging stuff, so how the parallelism working. So we can integrate in parallel, but of course there is a trick. So we integrate everything on a file level, source code. So first delivery comes in, touches those files, fine. Second one, great. Third one, great. Fourth one is coming in, boom, it's touched a file which is actually already being processed. And then fourth one, you will say, sorry, 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 you gotta yeah, wait till the next baseline. Because, yeah, we cannot, because it's just an overlap. And I will explain also later why it is important to avoid overlaps, because it enables some other cool stuff. I think it's cool, but we will see. So yes, parallelism is there, we can process, I think now, yeah, it's just configured, I think 16 deliveries in parallel, and then each uh, integration is also kind of time bound. We try to be within two hours ready. So we're able to integrate a lot every day. Um, yeah, and here it was also stolen slide. So basically, yeah, we use Jenkins to automate and uh, all the pass fail criteria, we just automated them. And it was also super important, it was a separate task on its own to get rid of instabilities. You cannot imagine, or maybe you can, I don't know, especially if you are in a big organization with longer history, how many instabilities you have. So you need to embed the retry protocols. You need to embed, uh, well, data analysis to actually to explain to the owners of the service, look, 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 it's freaking failing you know, pff, every other week, no good, you need to improve. So stabilization of environment, very important. Without it, yeah, pff, no way automation will work. Yeah, and then dedicated hardware, of course. You don't want cross talk with uh, some other processes. When you are mission critical, yeah, get your own hardware. No, so that part was integration to trunk. And now I will talk about baseline creation, right? Because uh, you still, uh, oh, we will touch it. Yes, we need to improve it because testing was taking a lot of time and analysis was taking a lot of time. But before we go there, by the way, I did not lose you yet. Or? No, good. 
also guys at the end? Good, excellent, that's it. Now, other thing. Again, big companies and small ones, you probably don't see it, but when you go to big one, you will see it. Huh? So when you have one tiny team, it's easy. One tiny team which does everything. But when, when company grows, this tiny team is growing, and then it's split in smaller teams and goes in different departments. And then it actually becomes very difficult to establish, like, okay, it's 9 o'clock. Uh, are we okay or not? Are tests okay or not? You need to ask somebody. And then somebody will say, yeah, tests actually were not even started. Like, why, why they are not started? I don't know. I only analyze test results. I don't know they were not started. So you need to start to ask a lot, a lot of people. What the hell is going on at night? Yeah, what, what the way it was? And these uh, nice pictures with like uh, yeah, connected dots. So with linear size of the group, interfaces are growing quadratically. And this is like, wow. This is a bitch, actually. <laughs> it's, it's awful. When you try to add people, your overheads are growing quadratically. Because interface is growing n multiplied by n minus 1 divided by 2. Right? Ringelman effect? Do you know what Ringelman effect is? Important stuff, huh? So when you have somebody like dedicated to this task, this guy or girl will do like 100% of, well, what he or she can. Yeah, try to put a uh, team and then ask team to do something, each, in each individual will do less than 100%. Ringelman effect. Just psychology. How to do? What uh, to do about that? Our choice was, you know what? You freaking visualize everything. Everything. All logs which you have, all different aspects, just visualize. Put it on a timeline because it will help you understand better how it all works, but also you will realize what are the norms and what are the abnormalities. And then abnormalities, you can actually set up some alerts, right? Yeah, I will not go into details, but yeah. So visualize, visualize, visualize. And our choice, by the way, for that one was, uh, well, InfluxDB with Grafana in uh, Asia, Azure, uh, Microsoft uh, Cloud Solution, exactly for this particular dashboard here, right? So visualization is the key, and it will be next slide which explain why, because sometimes, sometimes you talk to some people, but you see that you talk, yeah, not different language, but you describe exactly the same phenomenon, but from different points. I will come to that. Yes, so we're going to move here, how to improve testing, which is actually takes so many hours. The very first thing we did, we connected database to collect all the test results which we do, including test duration. And then it was something interesting. Apparently, vast majority of our tests are super fast. Basically, in 30 minutes, you can run 83% of your tests. And we have tail this tiny, tiny, to something percentage, which actually very long, and actually only those guys were defining that uh, complete test job was not done. Once we realize that, we kick them out <laughs> and say, hey, you got to improve because, you know, there are timing constraints. And then we immediately realize that uh, on premises, we don't have enough capacity to start to run our tests in parallel. And we really, really want to run our tests in parallel. Because if you still remember this one button integration scene, it also does the tests. So during the day, it schedules a bunch of tests. And it's very not nice when instead of processing, you actually see that the job of integrating stuck in test phase waiting for capacity. So like, what the hell? And also try to uh, answer on a question from manager when you are done. I don't know, I'm in a queue. So visualization help here as well. So this is one of the examples. Uh, just show how many CPU cores uh, on one of the testing clusters are in use in time. And then you like show to people who are responsible for capacity. And then they start to understand you. Because what they did, they have their own monitoring. Yeah? Everything is good. But the average over one week. And according to their numbers, 50% of our on-prem capacity is used. 
So why are you complaining? We should not have any more. You're using only 50. Look, they show you the numbers. But now you show this picture and say, okay, it's fine, agree. At night, <laughs> yeah, on weekend, yeah. What about uh, working day? We are hitting the limits all the time. And now they understand that and they say, ooh, indeed, indeed, we understand. And that actually leads to other cool stuff like, uh, for example, adopt new technology. So the fact that we have an uh, issue with uh, capacity on-prem will allow us to create very nice collaboration with uh, Google and to just uh, um, for tests which are done over weekend, for example, we don't care, we use on-prem, but when you need peak capacity, something on peak, you can offload to cloud. And then you are super fast. And then basically you can totally predict uh, how long your test request will take because it will be dictated by the longest test, right? Easy. So this was very, very nice. And this is truth. So yeah, we have a link. Let me see. Analysis. Yeah, this is also kind of nice because when you have automatic test, right? Well, test is a pass or fail, right? If it fail, well, no good. Yeah, your delivery not good. We need to fix something. But somehow we still have people to analyze that, which is totally not nice. Also, so not a nice job to be like wake up at seven o'clock in the morning and try to understand it all. So, 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 so why we have people? Because assume you have your stable fail, right? Good. So now you need to determine which of the deliveries yesterday caused it. And the guys and girls who were doing analysis well, their way of working was okay, we're going to invite everybody who integrated yesterday and we're going to have a nice discussion and then try to debug on a spot which delivery did it. And this is kind of yeah, not very efficient and when it does not really scale. Huh? Because if you will integrate eventually 100 deliveries per day or 1,000, you cannot get 1,000 uh, people in one room discuss why the test fail, right? Uh, and other thing is, assume you even identified who did it, right? Because we all work in projects, you probably as well, I don't know. So different projects deliver different functionality. And sometimes, sometimes you have a project which makes something for a new machine. Great. But by doing that, they actually broke something for all the machine. But all the machine apparently handled by different project. And then you can get in very ugly discussions like, yeah, we broke it. But we cannot fix it, we don't have resources. Other guy have resources. And then you talk to the other guy, and other guy is saying, yeah, but this is totally out of the blue. I don't have capacity to fix it. And this was ongoing like well, almost every day, which is totally not nice. So solution was, solution was, you still remember our robot does not allow overlap on file level. It means we can totally distinguish in automatic manner which delivery caused the fail. So in the night, we run a lot of tests, way more that are done during integration. So then we compare current baseline versus previous baseline. This test stably fail, we know that. So what you do now, you just rerun this test per delivery and you fully automatically identify which delivery did it. There's no need to have any meetings, nothing. You say, hey, you did it, no discussion. And also, because there is no overlap, you can totally automate revoke procedure. You can automatically create a project which basically per source code file, uh, well, bring it back to original version, right? Agree? No? Yes? Good. And that's exactly what is done now. So fully automatically tests are done, the ones are failed, Paluta is found, we call Paluta the delivery which actually caused something to fail regression impact. And fully automatically project is created to revoke this delivery. But we also try to be nice uh, and don't uh, immediately revoke. So project is created, but immediately mail is flying to the project. Hey guys, you broke this. It's okay. It's no big deal. Uh, we can revoke you, basically give you your delivery in a state like it was yesterday. But, but maybe you would like to fix today. If you do, 
No problem. This integration of this revoke will happen only at the end of the day, the very last action. If you deliver your fix, no problem. And this approach actually works. Huh? There are no discussions. People are actually very much willing to fix the things. So we liked it uh, very much because it's kind of, uh, well, self-recovery of our main trunk, right? Even if something is slipped in, there's no problem. We identify and we remove it uh, just uh, next day. No problem. So combining it all actually brought us to this. We were able to extend integration window also to cover our colleagues in Wilton in the United States. Because there we also have a big uh, development site. And it was, well, kind of very nice, I think. So that's why I presented here. So to sum up, to sum up. No, not to sum up. Again, the stolen slide. Uh, we go going to upgrade also tools, so instead of rational clear case, we're thinking about going to Git, because a lot of developers do not know what clear case anymore, and then G Jenkins to GitHub Actions, and instead of custom, okay. You can read the stuff, right? That's what we try to do, so we are trying to innovate and go forward, well, as we're supposed to do. Now, wrap up. Four lessons, huh? Assume nothing, replace everything what you can with automation, visualize everything, and uh, try to use out-of-the-box solutions. So this is kind of our recipe, nothing really new. But what I also understand, and we understand, that uh, we have this now, huh? we have this in place. Integration window is huge. We don't get dramatic influx of integration. There is a lot of mindset change needed. Namely, continuous integration means deliver every day. Just, just don't keep your delivery somewhere in your own branch. Don't spend time on rebasing. Just you come to work, you did something, it's good, it's compilable, will not break uh, anything in my neck. I've just deliver, just deliver. And this is one of the important things which we try to change now because tools are easy Culture is not that easy. Culture is not that easy. And that's uh, what we are pushing on right now. And I think now it's time for questions. I think it's okay, right? Uh, yes. So, are there any questions? Oh, you are too kind. <laughs> Good question. One button integration, uh, we started with that, it took around one year. And then improvement on a baseline, removal of polluter, connect cloud, one more year. Yes. Please. Uh, how can you manage dependencies? Which dependencies? Very true, very true. So we have a elaborate mechanism of switching, and if your feature is not ready, it's just switched off. So it's guaranteed while it's in main archive, it will not cause any regression impact because it's behind the switch. And when you get it back in your development branch, you activate it for you, play with it further. But it, it's also, this is kind of, I need to admit, uh, having too many switches brings you to configuration explosion. True. But that's why now we also try to approach it a little bit differently. If you will try to map our complete uh, space of configurations, it will be astronomical. But amount of scanners in the world which we produce is not astronomical. So we're actually thinking to test uh, almost per scanner. Because this is kind of the best way, yeah? then you can guarantee to customer your unique configuration. We tested it exactly on your config, and exactly this is your unique set of features. Please? Uh, how did you roll back? Did you have any? Because it looks it's only continuous delivery, even though like, there is a fixed time frame. But in case if uh, your tests or something, they, uh, they were not 
able to take the input. You only detect it when you got the production. Uh, do, do you do any rollback? Yeah, so this is polluter removal. So we identify who did it, and then we automatically create a process, yeah, right? Project, project, automatic project, which will take the sources of that delivery and will just uh, replace it to original software code version. So it's, it's automatic. Automatic, fully automatic. And it's allow us to do that because we never allow overlap on one source. Yeah. Yeah, this is cool stuff. I think this is, uh, yeah, what we are like very, very proud of that we can remove polluters automatically. Any more questions? Yes, please. How big was the team that you used to do this transition? This difficult question. I am now thinking, yeah. There were not too many people like per team, but there were multiple teams because, yeah, it's a big, big landscape. I'm guessing, I'm guessing, I think at least 15 in total. I think at least 15 like active uh, diehard developers in different areas. But there were more people like, I know, Scrum Masters and stuff, yeah, of course. It is difficult. It is freaking difficult. Any, any that I have one example, which we try, try to use. Of freaking stickers. So here is a sticker where Homer like pointing at you and say, what have you delivered to QBL today? What is QBL? You know what QBL? It's a strong, yeah? Why it's QBL? You know what it stands for, QBL? It stands for quality, bravery, leadership. I'm lying, just qualified baseline. <laughs> So, yeah, we try to, like, use lightweight humor. Yeah, so sticker is nice. Everybody likes stickers. And you put it on a laptop, you open laptop, somebody reading, what have I delivered to QBL today? I better deliver something. Right? But it's difficult, I agree. It's, oh. More questions? Okay, and I will assume everything was clear. <laughs> because when there are no questions, it's like two cases. Everything is clear or everything is not clear at all. <laughs> if you got questions later, that's why this like QR code, bunch of people ready to answer. Yeah, I think then that's it. We have three minutes for bio break. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you very much to be present. Thank you.